today we are going to talk about uh, the HPLC. HPLC is an analytical tool which is used uh, for identifying a unknown metabolite or a protein or a peptide as well as it can be used for quantification. So, HPLC has been uh, um, the short form of uh, high performance liquid chromatography or high pressure liquid chrom chromatography. So, HPLC also uses the techniques of uh, chromatography. So, you have different types of HPLCs which operate um, using different principles as we discussed uh, the various principles of uh, chromatography. So, the separation is achieved either through hydrophobic interactions or polar interactions or ionic forces and so on actually. So, we are going to look at uh, the HPLC today um, which is a very important tool which can be used for both small molecules as well as uh, large uh, proteins as well. Um, so, it is a very powerful analytical tool for identifying um, and quantifying small molecules, peptides, proteins, uh, metabolites, uh, drugs, um, natural chemicals, natural products, phytochemicals and so on actually. It is extremely powerful and um, you achieve uh, very good separations by changing the compositions of the um, mobile phase or changing the stationary phase and so on actually. Uh, so, what happens in an HPLC? You have a set of solutes and the solute uh, partitions between the stationary phase and the mobile phase. So, it is basically a relative solubility between two phases actually. Okay. So, the, the, the uh, solvent which is your uh, continuous phase or the mobile phase and you have the bonded phase or the stationary phase. So, your uh, compound gets equilibrated between these two phases and the separation happens because of the forces that act on the solute um, and hence you have a equilibrium process taking place. Okay. So, we have two types of HPLCs the normal phase and the reverse phase. So, what is a normal phase? Normal phase has a polar stationary phase whereas, your reverse phase has a non polar stationary phase. So, in a normal phase the stationary phase is a polar or a hydrophilic compound and the solvent is a non polar. Whereas, uh, in a reverse phase you have a non polar or a hydrophobic compound on the stationary phase and you use a polar solvent. So, nowadays um, the reverse phase chromatography has become very popular whereas, originally we had uh, the normal phase chromatography being the popular. That means, in a normal phase you have a hydrophilic uh, stationary phase. So, hydrophilic compounds uh, get <coughs> uh, adsorbed on to the um, hydrophilic uh, stationary phase. Whereas, in a reverse phase hydrophobic compounds get uh, adsorbed or get more uh, partitioned um, and hydrophilic compounds travel faster. So, in a reverse phase what are the solvents used? As I said in a reverse phase uh, the stationary phase is a hydrophobic compound. So, this uh, the continuous phase is a hydrophilic or a polar. So, you use methanol, you use acetonitrile, you can use tetrahydrofuron, tetrahydrofuron is also called THF or you use water or even combinations of uh, these two. <coughs> Sometimes we use uh, acetonitrile water combinations if you want to play around with the certain uh, dielectric constant or other parameters. So, uh, if you look at uh, this uh, solvent in a reverse phase predominantly you will be using water and water is very very cheap that is why reverse phase chromatography has become very popular. Whereas, if you use a normal phase chromatography the stationary phase is a polar like a silica for example, then you have to use a uh, hydrophobic uh, solvent like a uh, um, hydrocarbon. So, that is very very expensive. And normally in uh, this type of HPLC systems the amount of solvent which we use is quite a lot. So, the solvent cost is extremely high and um, generally we try to recover the solvent. In a reverse phase chromatography you use uh, uh, acetonitrile water. Um, so, you can use predominantly water and small amount of acetonitrile. So, uh, you will uh, lose only small amount of acetonitrile. So, operating cost in a reverse phase chromatography is much less when compared to the operating cost in a um, normal phase chromatography. 
and sometimes we also use three solvents as I said if you want to play around with the dielectric constant in separations we sometimes use uh, say methanol, acetonitrile, water and so on actually. We will look at some of those solvents as uh, we proceed in this course. Uh, so, what are the columns used? Suppose uh, you have solid support usually about uh, 10, 5 or 3 micron silica or polymeric particles. Okay. So, on top of that you have bonded phases functional groups linked. The functional groups are um, covalently linked to the solid support. You also have a god column this is a small column which is placed before the original large uh, column. So, this god column acts as a filter. So, it captures um, particles, it captures um, polymeric materials and other uh, unwanted materials thereby it is prolonging the life of the analytical column. You, after some time um, after about 10,000 hours of use or something you can throw away the god column and replace it with another guard column. So, what are the bonded phases we use in a reverse phase uh, chromatography? We use uh, ethyl silyl. So, the ethyl is the hydrophobic or you can use octyl silyl or we can use octodecyl silyl that is a C18 or we can even use a cyanopropyl silyl. So, what we have? We have ethyl or octyl or octadecyl. So, as we go down the series we are making it more hydrophobic and hydrophobic. Okay. So, that is the advantage of it and the C18 type of columns have become extremely popular and it has also become ubiquitous that means it is used in quite a lot of applications practically uh, separation of many phytochemicals or even organic metabolites. So, a typical setup of an HPLC. So, we have the column here the column will be in the order of several meters. Okay. Then uh, we have a pump here and we have uh, several tanks having various mobile phases. Either we can run one single mobile phase that is called an isocratic system or we can have two mobile phases. We can shift from one mobile phase to another over a period of time. So, that we get some sort of a gradient which can improve the separation efficiency. So, there may be one pump if you are an isocratic or you may have two pumps pumping two different solvents. So, you have the pump and then there is the injector that is where you are injecting your solute mixture okay. and then finally, you have the detector. There are different types of detectors that are used in HPLC depending upon the type of components you are separating. We can have refractive index detector, you have UV detectors, um, we have diode array detectors, light scattering detectors, even mass spec acts as a detector. So, you can have a HPLC mass spectrometer connected to each other that is called an LCMS. So, mass spec will detect the mass of the analyte that is coming out and um, the LC or the HPLC does the real separation of the various components. So, this is a typical setup. The pump is the most important in the sense uh, uh, it has to deliver very high pressure. We in HPLC the pressures are extremely high 30, 40, 50 bars because you are using very fine particles in micron sized and so the back pressure developed is also very large. So, we are going to look at uh, uh, different types of detectors their advantages and disadvantages during the course of this lecture. So, you may have a UV detector that means a single wavelength UV detector exactly matching one particular wavelength if you know the components um, come at this particular wavelength we just have a single UV detector it is very cheap or we can have a variable wavelength detector using a monochromator or if you have a multiple wavelength detector. Okay. So, these are more expensive than a single wavelength. You can have a fluorescence detector if you know the compounds are fluorescing. We can have an electrochemical detector, we can have a mass spectrometric detector. So, lot of detectors depending upon the type of compounds and how um, they behave. Typically a column specification looks like this you know the C18 column this is the column dimension it is a 4.6 meter long column uh, 255 okay. it is a particle size is 5 micron <coughs> and we have uh, 30 angstrom pore size that means the pore size of the particles which are supported um, 
are 300 angstrom. So, this is a typical uh, specification for a column. <coughs> now, the output from HPLC will be a chromatogram, okay. it will be like a Gaussian distribution or normal distribution and so on. But if you have multiple components and if your separation is not very, very good, uh, you may have peaks coming out like this. This is a peak, this is another peak, but both are overlapping so much we cannot differentiate the area of this peak or area of this peak. Or you may have a reasonable separation, but still this is not a good separation. Again, you have some overlap in this region and uh, this is the best separation one can hope for. You get a very good baseline separation. These two components are um, well separated, so we can measure the area under this curve, we can measure the area under this curve independently without any error. So, we can determine what is the concentration of the species, what is the concentration of this species. So, ideally one would like to have this type of separation, but one may end up like this and this is extremely poor. And imagine if you have many components, you are going to have many peaks overlapping, some of them overlapping, some of them well spread out. So, you the challenge is to separate each one of the component um, clearly at the baseline, so that you can measure the area under the curve and hence the composition of the particular component of interest. So, the x axis you have the time and the y axis will be your detection signal. So, this is called the retention time that is the time at which you get the maximum of this particular peak. Uh, so, the retention time is very characteristic of a particular component for a given HPLC hardware as well as given solvent and solvent flow rate. If you change solvent flow rate, uh, you are going to change your retention time or if I use different column, I am going to get a different uh, retention time. So, the retention time is very, very characteristic in a HPLC system. So, if I want to detect uh, a compound and if I know what that compound probably is, what do I do? I get a pure authentic sample from a manufacturer, inject it in HPLC and see the retention time and then when I inject the mixture and I see a compound coming out at the same retention time, then I can tell probably this particular compound is present in that mixture. So, that is how we do uh, identification of uh, components. So, suppose uh, we are looking at 3 or 4 uh, and what we know and what we expect. Uh, it will be there in my mixture. I will buy those 3 or 4 authentic samples from a manufacturer, inject each one of them independently and uh, check its retention time. And when I inject the mixture and if I get uh, those 3 or 4 peaks at those retention times, then I can tell that my mixture contains these components. So, that is the identification part in HPLC. How about quantification? In a quantification, what do we do? Um, we inject authentic sample at certain concentration and we identify the area under the curve. So, using that relationship between area under the curve and concentration, I can tell how much concentration of a another component is present in the mixture by measuring the area under the curve. So, it typically the output from a HPLC will look like this, you will have a nice looking Gaussian distribution. Uh, we talked quite a lot about Gaussian distribution and the type of equation a normal distribution will have and so on. So, we can apply those uh, knowledge, uh, those equations in HPLC as well. Okay. So, normally you will get a nice uh, looking Gaussian distribution and this is called the retention time okay. and this is called the height of the peak and this is called the half the height and this is called the width at half height. So, here this is called the width of the peak which is done by drawing two parallel lines okay, and uh, you get the width at the base and the width at half the height. That means, you check what is the half the height of this and then measure the width that is called width at half height. Now, there is a parameter called um, theoretical plates, just like we studied the theoretical plates with the chromatography. We here also you have the concept of theoretical plates and the three theoretical plates could be estimated by measuring the retention time as well as either the width 
at the base or width at the half maximum. Okay. Theoretical plates is a measure of the um, efficiency of the HPLC column. So, if a column has large number of theoretical plates as against another column which has a smaller number of theoretical plates, we can say the one which has large number of theoretical plates to be more um, efficient in separating components. Uh, so, these are some formulae which can be used to measure the theoretical plates. N is the theoretical plates, T r is the retention time, W is the width at the base. So, you have n equal to 16 into T r by W whole square or we can use this equation if you are measuring W per half. That means, if you are measuring the width at half maximum, then we use instead of 16 here you will get 5.54. Okay. Or there is another equation this is called n equal to 25 into T r by W phi s whole square, where W phi s is the peak width at 4.4 percent of the peak height. Okay. If this is the peak height 4.4 will come somewhere there. Okay. So, this width will be like this you know the big width. So, if you have that then you have to multiply by 25. So, uh, W phi s will be width somewhere here whereas, W is the width when you draw two tangents to this uh, Gaussian distribution. So, we can use different equations to calculate the uh, number of theoretical plates and uh, um, there will be small differences depending upon uh, the equation which we use. Because uh, although we say this is a very Gaussian looking distribution, it is never so. There will be small uh, differences in its normal distribution shape. So, the n which we calculate from this equation or this equation or this equation will be slightly different. But we can use the same equation. Uh, if you want to compare different columns, so that uh, we do not get confused with the value of n which we get. So, um, all you have to do is inject a sample, determine its retention time, determine uh, its width at half maximum, use this equation and calculate your number of uh, theoretical plates. And then uh, if you take another column, do the same job, get the number of theoretical plates. So, we can use this equation to compare quantitatively between two different columns and say which column is more efficient um, in separating a mixture um, and which column is less efficient. Okay. Now, there are many issues uh, if you are performing uh, HPLC, it is not so easy. This is this example is taken from a book, uh, Skoog and Leary Principles of Instrumental Analysis. You see, um, we are having uh, 6 components. So, we are getting 2 nice peaks and after some time we get a slightly broader peak and after a very very long time we get extremely shallow peaks, peak number 5 and 6. So, these peaks may be coming at a very long time number 1. Number 2 they are so broad um, area under the curve when you measure there will be a lot of uh, errors. Okay. So, to overcome the problem, I may change the solvent conditions. That means, I may change type of solvents. When I do that, I may get 5 and 6 closer, these are nice and sharp peaks, but then you see 1 and 2 has overlapped and uh, 3 and 4 also has overlapped. We cannot differentiate 1 and 2, but we can slightly differentiate 3 and 4. So, okay, again we play around with the, uh, with the solvent mixtures and so on. 5 and 6 uh, look reasonably good, 3 and 4 very good separations, but still 1 and 2 is not very very good separation, because uh, there is a large overlap. So, if you are measuring area under the curve for 1 and 2, we are going to have large error. So, again this is also not very good. So, we need to again uh, work uh, on the solvent uh, optimization until we get reasonably a good baseline separation for 1 and 2. So, these are some issues uh, we call it elution issue issues. So, you need to play around uh, with the various uh, solvents in the uh, continuous phase that is very very important. Okay. There is another chromatography which we use quite a lot in uh, um, synthetic organic chemistry and I also talked about it uh, over the past uh, 10 lectures that is called thin layer chromatography. 
So, we can use it for qualitatively um, looking at a mixture of a biological or a small molecule chemical components. The advantages are it is low cost, you need very little sample for that, we can use different mobile phases to perform, it is very flexible, uh, very easy sample detection, uh, we can even go for high sample loading, ease of handling is all good. So, if I am doing a, a synthetic organic chemistry where I am performing a reaction A plus B and I want to know whether C is formed or D is formed, all I have to do is run a thin layer chromatography and see whether I get new spots. So, thin layer chromatography is based on spots which I find on the plate, chromatographic plate. Okay. Uh, so, that is the main advantage, we can monitor a reaction. Suppose, I have a raw material and I am slowly getting a product, uh, initially the raw material will give one spot, as the product is formed I will get two spots, one for the raw material as well as one for the product. After some time, when the raw material completely gets converted, and the raw material spot will disappear and I will have only the product spot. So, beautifully we can monitor reactions. So, organic chemists use this TLC technique uh, um, uh, very extensively uh, practically every day for all their synthetic organic chemistry and synthesis work. So, how does it work? So, you may have a glass plate, I may coat it with silica on the glass plate, okay. then I put an initial mixture sp spot and then take a solvent which is the eluent. Okay. So, now it is a silica, so it is a normal phase chromatography, silica is a hydrophilic compound or a polar compound. So, I have another uh, solvent which um, moves as it travels upward due to capillary effect, it carries components with it, components which are tightly bound to silica remain at the bottom, components which are loosely bound will start, start travelling. So, over a long period of time, um, I am going to get various uh, products in the mixture as various spots. Ideally, I would like to get clean, sharp, separated spots, but sometimes what happens is you may get overlap of spots. So, it is a very simple system, all I need is a glass plate and I coat just silica and I put it in a solvent mixture. So, I can play around with different types of solvent mixture, so that I change the polarity and hence the uh, movement of the solute from bottom to top. So, this is called a thin layer chromatography and uh, it is as I said widely used in uh, synthetic organic chemistry, it is also used in uh, downstream processing if I am looking at separations of uh, small peptides or biomolecules. Okay. So, how does it happen? You have a capillary action. The, so, the solvent and the solution mixture, solute mixture flows upwards. So, based on the partition coefficient, the solid will adsorb fraction of each component of the mixture, remainder will be in the solution will be traveling up. So, if it is tightly bound on silica, it try becomes very hard for it to travel upwards, whereas if it is loosely bound on silica, it becomes much easy for it to move upwards. So, substance that is strongly adsorbed by the solid matrix will have a greater fraction of it adsorbed. So, it will spend more time on the support and less time in the solution. Whereas, a weakly adsorbed substance will have a smaller fraction of it adsorbed, hence it will move fast. So, weakly adsorbed substance will move up the plate and strongly adsorbed substance will stay near the bottom of the plate. So, um, from the location of the various spots, we can tell components which are strongly adsorbed on silica components which are weakly adsorbed on silica. So, alumina is the strongest adsorbent followed by charcoal and fluorescyl, magnesia, silica, anhydrous and so on. And silica gel is the least adsorbing in this uh, particular group of components actually. With alumina as the adsorbent, we can use different types of solvents depending upon uh, whether I want least eluting power or whether I want strong eluting power. Okay. So, with the alumina as the adsorbent, solvent with the least eluting power are petroleum ether like hexane, pentane, uh, then goes cyclohexane, then goes carbon tetrachloride, then goes benzene, uh, dichloromethane, chloroform, ether, ethyl acetate, acetone, 
ethanol, methanol, water and pyridine. So, with the alumina as adsorbent the solvent with greatest diluting power will be organic acids. So, if I am using alumina I need to play around with the solvents depending upon whether I want a, a least diluting or I want a greatest diluting power. So, most strongly adsorbed are acids and bases <coughs> and least strongly adsorbed are saturated hydrocarbons because you are using a <coughs> Uh, stationary phase like uh, silica or alumina which are uh, polar or hydrophilic. So, least strongly adsorbed are saturated hydrocarbons, alkyl halides, unsaturated hydrocarbons, alkenyl halides, aromatic hydrocarbons, aryl halides, polyhalogenated, then comes hydrocarbons, ethers, esters, aldehydes, ketones and alcohols. So, alcohols because they are hydrophilic will get strongly adsorbed whereas, um, hydrocarbon which are extremely hydrophobic or leastly adsorbed. So, the relationship between the distance these solutes travel because of the solvent after they have reached uh, equilibrium is given by something called RF value. So, RF value is a characteristic of the compound for a given stationary phase. So, RF value is the distance traveled by the solute divided by distance traveled by the solvent front. Okay. So, it is the distance traveled by the solute divided by distance traveled by the solvent frame. <coughs> so, if the RF value is very very large obviously, it will the compound travels faster or very far after it has achieved equilibrium. If the RF value is very small then you can say that compound has not traveled very far in the system. So, for example, I have TLC Okay. Then I go to a reverse phase HPLC. How do I connect the spots I get on TLC with the peaks that I get in the HPLC? So, that depends upon the type of HPLC whether I am using a normal phase HPLC or whether I am using a reverse phase HPLC. Now, um, in a TLC we use generally silica. So, it is almost like a polar stationary phase. Now, if I take a normal phase chromatography I will again use a polar stationary phase. So, the order of the components in a TLC which uses silica as against your normal phase chromatography will be the same. So, if I take a TLC and I see a spot C which is right at the bottom and then I see B and then I see A. Okay. That means, here C is uh, very very high polar and A is the least polar. So, in a normal phase what will happen? A will come out first, B will come out second, C will come out third. That means, A will have the least uh, uh, elution time or uh, retention time B will have the next retention time and C will have the highest retention time. So, in a normal phase HPLC we are using silica. Um, so, that is also a, a polar. So, they will behave in the same fashion as a normal phase TLC which also uses silica. Whereas, if I use a reverse phase HPLC where I am using a hydrocarbon like a C18 as the stationary phase. Okay. So, now the stationary phase is hydrophobic or lipophilic. Then what happens? So, in a hydrophobic reverse phase chromatography I use a polar as the mobile phase. So, what will happen? C which is more polar will come out first, B which is next will come and finally, A which is hydrophobic or non-polar or lipophilic will come out last. So, you see the order of the way these three components A, B, C come in a normal phase vis a vis a reverse phase are very very different. So, you should not get confused you should know um, if I get uh, in a TLC uh, three components A travelling the farthest B in the middle C travelling the least. If you are using a normal phase you will have uh, A coming out first um, that means A having the lowest retention time followed by B and C will have the highest retention time. Whereas, if I use a reverse phase chromatography 
C will have the least res, uh, retention time and A will have the highest retention time. So, you see that there is a completely um, reverse happening in the normal phase and the reverse phase uh, chromatographies. Okay. So, you need to understand uh, this concept very very well. So, that uh, if I do a TLC during initial uh, downstream processing and then later on I am going to HPLC, I should be able to tell um, depending upon the type of HPLC I am using um, when each of the components will come with respect to the spots which I observe in my TLC. Okay. Now, let us go forward. Um, so, you have a normal phase chromatography. I have a low polarity mobile phase. Okay. It is a normal phase chromatography. So, I am the stationary phase is polar do not forget that. Uh, so, I have components like this C, B, A. So, if I am increasing the polarity what happens? I am having a polar stationary phase and uh, I am increasing the polarity. So, obviously, these three will come together. Okay. So, that means, if I am using a normal phase chromatography, um, if the peaks are very close, I want to move the peaks further apart, I reduce the polarity. That means, I relatively make it more hydrophilic, sorry hydrophobic. So, in a normal phase chromatography, if the peaks are very close and I want to move the peaks further apart, I use a slightly more hydrophobic system. That means, I reduce the polarity of this uh, mixture. Now, let us go to reverse phase. Suppose, I have a reverse phase chromatography and uh, my peaks are like this C, B and A. Now, my solvent mixture or mobile phase is a high polarity. If I reduce the polarity to medium, then they will come closer. So, in a reverse phase chromatography, if the peaks are very, very close, all I have to do is increase the polarity of the mobile phase, then the peaks will get separated out. So, in a normal phase chromatography, if the peaks are closer, I reduce the polarity for the peaks to separate out. Whereas, in reverse phase chromatography, if the peaks are closer, I increase the polarity, so that the components get separated out. So, you see the strategy which you adapt um, in a normal or a reverse phase um, changes dramatically. So, if you want to move from uh, a close to a further separated system. So, what are the various factors that affect the column efficiency? Factors which affect the column efficiency or the linear velocity of the mobile phase. So, if the velocity is uh, high, then obviously, my retention time goes down relatively. Uh, diffusion coefficient in the mobile phase, diffusion coefficient in the stationary phase. That means, uh, how the components diffuse inside the pores of the stationary phase. Then we have the retention factor. That means, how much uh, of the solute is taken up by the stationary phase. Diameter of the packing material, thickness of the liquid coating on the stationary phase. So, if you have thick material, you are going to have uh, uh, mass transfer resistances. If you have very thin coating, you are going to have less mass transfer re resistance. So, all these factors affect the column efficiency. So, you can play around with many of the factors, but once I select my column, I mean some of the factors get fixed, whereas uh, I can still play around with the, the solvent flow rate or I can play around with the mixtures of solvent. So, that I affect my retention factor as well as I affect my uh, linear velocity of the mobile phase. So, imagine uh, I have uh, three components and I am using a UV detector. That means, uh, uh, the components are detected using a UV. So, if I set the detector to 240 nanometers and suppose I have three components like this aspirin, astominophen and caffeine, I may get uh, area under the curve for aspirin 19.5, the acetaminophen as 50, caffeine as 20. Now, if I change the detector setting to 254 nanometers, then this becomes 7.3 area under the curve goes down dramatically 
and uh, this becomes very very large 81.9 caffeine becomes 10.8. Now, if you have set the detector to 80 nanometer aspirin becomes 24, astromephine becomes 39.3, caffeine becomes 35.9. Now, how much is the real amount we do not know because detect depending upon the detector setting I am getting different area under the curve percentage area under the curve. Why is it so? That is because of the lambda max if the lambda max for each of the components are very different uh, depending upon where I set the lambda max that particular component um, will show a very high area. So, that is another big challenge when you are doing HPLC. So, I may get mistaken whether the component uh, astronomy is very very large or uh, it is equal to caffeine. So, you see that I am able to get different area under the curves for aspirin depending upon the lambda max of my UV detector. So, I need to have some idea about uh, the lambda max for the components which I am measuring um, in my in my solution or in my solute mixture. If I do not know then I may end up with this type of uh, uh, misunderstanding of the whole system. So, you see UV max for aspirin is 225 and 296 okay. astronomy is 248. So, uh, at 254 I get a very very large number. So, when I go away from 248 you see the astronomy fin keeps going down. Now, for caffeine it is 272. So, as I keep increasing see the caffeine percentage goes up. So, the main problem here is the lambda max aspirin has a lower lambda max caffeine has the next one uh, sorry astrominophine has the next one and caffeine has the uh, third largest. So, the numbers keep dramatically changing. So, you see the aspirin uh, it goes down and again increases because aspirin has two different lambda maxes. So, there is one lambda max here that is why you get some number as we move out from that particular number the value goes down and again it goes up it picks up because aspirin has two lambda max. So, the first thing is to uh, you we use uh, variable uh, system just to find out the lambda max of various components present in my mixture and then you decide which lambda max to use if I want to use a constant uh, UV detector and then do all your uh, standardization measurements and so on actually. So, understanding the lambda max for each one of the component is very very important that is what this particular example tells you otherwise you can totally get mistaken. Okay. Now, there are different types of uh, liquid chromatographies we can use depending upon the type of uh, um, molecule which you are trying to detect. This is taken from a book by Lindsay and Barnes uh, from John Miley publication it is called high performance liquid chromatography. Now, if it is a small molecule like molecular mass less than 2000 it could be soluble in water that means, it is hydrophilic or it could be soluble in organic solvent that means, it is hydrophobic. Now, in soluble in water it could be ionizable or it could be non ionic or ion paired type of system. So, if it is an ionic then I can use a ion exchange or ion chromatography. It is a non ionic or ion paired okay, then I can use a bonded normal phase chromatography. Okay. So, it is a normal phase that means, the stationary phase will be hydrophilic. Now, soluble in water now let us go to the system if the system is soluble in organic solvents that means, it is hydrophobic. Now, here we can have two different things one is soluble in non polar to weakly polar solvents soluble in moderately polar to polar solvent. Okay. So, if it is non polar to weakly then we go to reverse phase chromatography here we can use C 18, C 8, C 4, C 2 or phenyl or cyano this is completely hydrophobic material. So, we go for reverse phase chromatography whereas, it is moderately polar to polar solvents. So, it may be soluble in chloroform or uh, methanol. So, if it is soluble in chloroform we go to adsorption type of chromatography that means, the stationary phase forces 
or just based on adsorptive forces or it is soluble in alcohol, acetate nitrile or ethyl acetate. So, here we use bonded or normal phase chromatography ok. Again we see we use a normal phase chromatography with cyano or amino or diol as the stationary phase. So, depending upon this is for small molecules depending upon uh, whether molecule is soluble in water or it is, it is soluble in organic solvent. If it is soluble in water is it ion, easily ionized or it is non ionic or ion poet we may have two different types of chromatography either ion exchange or normal phase. Now, on the other side if it is soluble in organic solvents then uh, one could be uh, soluble only in weak polar or completely non polar or the other one could be moderately polar solvent. Completely non polar we may be using a reverse phase chromatography whereas, in a moderately polar we can have two systems one is the chloroform soluble other one is the alcohol soluble or acetonitrile soluble. So, in a chloroform soluble we may be using a silica based chromatography whereas, uh, in the other one we may be using a normal phase uh, chromatography like cyano, amino, diol and so on actually ok. Now, let us look at uh, molecules which are larger than 2000 that means, they are much larger molecules whereas, so far we looked at molecules which are smaller than 2000 ok. So, again this is taken from the same book uh, high performance liquid chromatography second edition Lindsay and Barnes ok. Again you have soluble in water, soluble in organic solvents. So, soluble in water again it can be ionic, it can be non ionic or ion paired. If it is ionic we can use a ion exchange chromatography. If it is non ionic it could be small molecular size or large molecular size. So, if it is a small molecular size we can use a reverse phase or hydrophobic interaction chromatography like different types of uh, stationary phases C18, C8, C4. If it is a large molecular size 30 to 400 nanometers then we can use a molecular exclusion chromatography ok. It is that size exclusion chromatography uh, we talked about it long time back it is called a size exclusion or gel permeation. So, it is based on size or molecular weight alone. So, larger sized polymers to smaller sized polymers, larger size uh, metabolites to smaller size metabolites or larger molecular weight metabolites to smaller molecular weight. Now, that is to do with the solubility in water what happens if they are not soluble in water, but they are soluble in organic solvents ok. Again you can have small molecules and large molecules, small means less than 30 nanometers, large means 30 to 400 nanometers. So, large molecules we can again go for the exclusion chromatography like size exclusion or gel filtration chromatography, whereas small molecule we can go for reverse phase chromatography. C18, C8, C4. So, again uh, the large systems um, we again have a water soluble large systems or solvent organic solvent soluble large systems. If the size of the molecules or molecular weights of the molecules are very large we can go for gel permeation chromatography. Uh, of course, if it is ionic we cannot use a gel permeation chromatography because as you can see here you can use only a an exchange chromatography gel permeation chromatography is good for non ionic or ion paired systems actually, which is based on just plain size separations. So, smaller molecules will get entrapped in the pores of uh, your uh, stationary phase, whereas larger molecules uh, do not get entrapped. So, they travel faster. So, larger molecules will come out of the uh, column faster, whereas uh, smaller molecules will take uh, much uh, longer time because they interact. So, this uh, table gives you what type of chromatography to use depending upon whether it is a small molecule or whether it is a large molecule. So, the molecules are large we can go for an exchange chromatography or we can go for uh, um, gel permeation chromatography or we can go for hydrophobic interaction or reverse phase chromatography. If the molecular sizes are very small again we go for an exchange chromatography, normal phase chromatography, adsorption chromatography and 
reverse phase chromatography. So, uh, selections based on the ionizability, selection based on the size of the molecule, selections based on the solubility of the molecule. Okay. There is something called isocratic elution that means I use only one mobile phase. It is very simple, very cheap, I use only one uh, solvent, I use only one pump. The pump is very, very expensive in a HPLC. So, by using uh, only one pump, I am able to bring down the cost. Or if I want to use two solvents, I mix the solvents and make it in a container and use that mixed solvent um, for elution. Okay. But still I use only one pump. So, it is simpler, you do not need a mixing chamber. If I have two solvents, then obviously I need a mixing chamber. Okay. Uh, but it has got limited flexibility because um, uh, I cannot change the dielectric constant of the operation. It is good for routine operation. So, if I am going to do the same uh, system like a QC lab where you are going to do the same thing day in and day out uh, for very long time to come, this is the best system. Gradient elution where the mobile phase compositions are changed as a function of time. So, initially you may start with one one solvent as time proceeds I change the solvent to something else. Okay. This is just like a gas chromatograph. In gas chromatograph um, either you can do um, the, the chromatography in um, one single temperature value that means the column is placed inside the oven and the temperature is maintained constant or as a function of time I can change the temperature of the column. Over so, I may start with say 150 and in 10 minutes I may go to 250 and then maintain at the temperature. So, exactly similar to changing the temperature in a gas chromatograph, I am changing the um, solvent dielectric constant in a HPLC system. So, I may start with one solvent, I may go into another solvent or I may start with one solvent mixture, then I move to some other solvent mixture. So, that is called the gradient dilution which is opposite to your isocratic. So, you will be using multiple pumps. So, you can use two pumps or you can use four pumps that means, it can be a binary system or it can be quaternary system and of course, the cost is very high because pump costs are very high. So, more the pumps more is the cost. So, when I change the mobile phase components I am changing the polarity index. So, I can use it to elute compounds that are not coming out of my column, they stick inside, they stay inside. So, the, but the problem is there could be some additional wear on the stationary phase. After each run, I have to again bring it back to the original condition. So, uh, each run will take longer. So, I do a run and then I will bring it back to the original condition, which requires again uh, several minutes. So, um, in a gradient elution, normally the time taken is much, much longer than a yeah, isocratic elution because in isocratic, you are not changing the composition of the um, solvent over a period of time. So, you do not have to again re equilibrate the system. Okay. So, that is uh, uh, one of the uh, disadvantages of gradient elution, it takes much longer time, but uh, we can get excellent separations um, using two solvents or three solvents or mixtures of solvents that is the main advantage of this type of uh, um, gradient elution. Okay. There are various types of detectors that are possible um, in uh, HPLC depending upon the, uh, the properties of the solutes, top properties of the amino acids or proteins or peptides which you are separating and we are going to now look at uh, um, the, some of the detectors look at some of the advantages, disadvantages and so on actually. Okay. The most cheapest one is the single beam UV visible with a flow through cell Kuwait. That means, you take your sample <coughs> inside a Kuwait and there is a, uh, a UV which measures the absorbance of the solute mixture. Generally, it operates at a 254 nanometer default wavelength, but we can also set it for other wavelengths also. You know. Some UV detectors you cannot set it, then it is very, very cheap, but there may be UV detectors where you can preset it to 
some fixed value 3, 4 uh, different wavelengths or we can use even filters. We can also have adjustable wavelength units um, which are cost effective. Uh, the main uh, advantage is the cost, it is very very cheap and then it is non destructive. Okay. So, the sample we can take it back and use it for some other purposes. So, especially if the sample amount is very small, you cannot have afford to have uh, a sample which is totally destroyed after the analysis. So, that is the main advantage. But the disadvantage is not all compounds will absorb the light. So, you will not be able to detect a compound which is not uh, UV detectable at all. So, that is a big problem or we can have several cells with different wavelengths fixed wavelengths. So, we can look at uh, various wavelengths uh, in each one of the cell. So, that is uh, other approach by which we can uh, slightly improve the flexibility of these type of uh, UV detectors. Now, uh, we will look at uh, more detectors in the next classes and as I said um, depending upon the detector we can uh, look at uh, the compounds that are present in the mixture um, to very very simple compounds to very complex compounds. So, we shall continue this particular topic in the next class.